Hello, and welcome to the fifth webinar in our radiation safety. Um, and sorry, my notes are being hidden. Sorry, and wellness webinar series, solar radiation and sun safety at work. I'm Lynn McDonald, liaison scientist with the Radiation Safety Institute of Canada. I'll be joined today by Dr. Cheryl Peters, PhD from Carex Canada. Mandel Fraser from Power Yoga West in Prince Edward Island will lead us in our wellness segment beginning at 1240 Eastern. Let's take a moment to go over the functionality of the Zoom meeting. We ask that during the presentation portion that the audio and video be from the presenters only. We have found that although you can access the audio through the computer or telephone, the quality of sound tends to be better when listening from a computer. If you have technical difficulties, you can contact Maria Costa, who is with us in the chat today at 1-800-263-5803, extension 321. If you have questions arising from the content, please type them into the chat. As the webinar is only 40 minutes in length and is immediately followed by our wellness session, time may not permit for us to answer all of them during the webinar. The answers will be posted on our website, along with a link to the video recording and a copy of the slides. This can be found under education webinars. I will be sending a confirmation of attendance email after the webinar and will include a link to the page with that communication. I will also include the topics covered in the length of time spent in the webinar, as some people have requested this to send to the professional association. Lastly, I have automatic closed captioning enabled in the slide presentation. If they are being blocked by your Zoom controls, you should be able to select a different way to view the webinar in Zoom, which makes them easier to see. The format for today will be a short presentation, giving an overview of terminology related to the measurement of UV exposures and organizations which make recommendation for workplace UV exposures. This will be followed by an interview of and question and answer with Dr. Cheryl Peters, PhD. Cheryl is CAREX Principal Investigator at CAREX Canada. She started working with CAREX Canada at the beginning of the project in 2007. She is a Senior Scientist for Cancer Prevention at the BC Centre for Disease Control and BC Cancer. She is also an adjunct professor in the School of Population and Public Health at the University of British Columbia and an adjunct assistant professor in the Department of Oncology at the University of Calgary. Cheryl has an MSc and PhD in Occupational Environmental Hygiene, both from the University of British Columbia. Her research interests include occupational exposure assessment, particularly for solar UV radiation, the effects of sex and gender on occupational carcinogen exposures, and exposures in the construction industry. Cheryl also holds a BSc in Earth and Ocean Sciences and Geography, and her interest in environmental and occupational health stemmed from her work as a geologist in northern BC and the Yukon. During the interview, we will learn about Carex Canada as a research group and Dr. Peters' role within it. She will share her expertise in workplace exposures to solar radiation and best practices for protection. She will include information about resources available for the public, workers, and employers. As time permits, she will answer questions from participants. For the final 20 minutes, Mandel Fraser from Power Yoga West in Prince Edward Island will lead us through stretching and mindfulness practices for the wellness portion of the webinar. Energy is the ability to change matter in specific ways. Radiation is the transfer of energy out from a source. There are different types of radiation, but one major category is electromagnetic waves. These waves have several defining properties in common, such as their speed of light in empty space. They also sometimes behave like waves and sometimes like particles of pure energy called photons. This phenomena is called wave particle duality. All electromagnetic radiation carries energy, but how much energy each photon carries increases as the frequency of light goes up and wavelength goes down. Depending upon the photon energy, frequency, and wavelength, which are interrelated, how one photon will interact with material can be quite different than another. For more information on the EMF spectrum, see our April 18, 2021 webinar, EMF and Wi-Fi. 
Ultraviolet is defined as the electromagnetic radiation in the wavelength range of 100 nanometers to 400 nanometers. This range is further delineated into three categories with increasing photon energies, UVA, UVB, and UVC. For additional detail about ultraviolet and its health effects, see our June 17, 2021 webinar dedicated to this topic. The sun is the main natural source of ultraviolet radiation exposure. The atmosphere, especially ozone in the stratosphere, filters all solar UVC radiation and most UVB radiation. This is fortunate. Without this protection, the higher energy UV exposure would sterilize the surface of the Earth. Sorry. We will delve into health considerations from solar UV exposure with Dr. Peters. But first, I will overview some quantities you may come across when looking at occupational guidelines. To understand the limits of, for solar exposure, we first must clarify the meaning of the words energy and power. Often used synonymously in everyday language, in physics, they are two distinct but related quantities. Energy is the ability to change matter in defined ways. There are many different forms of energy, Kinetic and potential energy together are considered mechanical energy. Light is a form of energy. There is energy stored in chemical bonds, etc. Energy cannot be created or destroyed, but it can change forms. In the SI system, its unit is the joule. Other common units for energy are the electron volt and the calorie. Power is the rate at which energy is converted from one form to another. In other words, it's the amount of energy converted by a process in a given amount of time. In the SI system, the unit of for power is the watt, and one watt is one joule per second. When measuring the strength of a source of radiation, one can consider all the energy being emitted from the source or how concentrated the energy is at the location where it is being measured. Not all the energy of the sun arrives to the surface of the earth, and as it travels to the Earth, not only is it absorbed by the Earth's atmosphere, but also spreads out in all directions, which lessens its intensity upon arrival. Therefore, for the purposes of measuring solar irradiation of the skin, it makes sense to be looking at what is arriving at our skin rather than the total output of the sun. Radiant exposure is a measure of the amount of electromagnetic energy per unit of surface area being hit by radiation. In the SI system, it is measured in joules per square meter. You may also see it reported as joules uh, per, in square centimeters, which is a more reasonable size when we're looking at um, the size of our body. Similarly, irradiance is a measure of the amount of electromagnetic energy conversion or power per unit of surface area being hit by the UV radiation. It has units of watts per square meter or square centimeter. Another term you may come across when discussing solar UV is the SED or standard erythema dose. Both the International Commission on Illumination, CIE 125-1997 and ANSI IES LS121 define standard erythema dose is equivalent to an erythemal effective radiant exposure of 100 joules per square meter. This measure takes into account the extreme variations in skin sensitivity to the frequency of ultraviolet radiation. The term erythema and erythemal refer to reddening of the skin. To quote the CIE, the problem of dysymmetry in skin photobiology lies in the fact that the ability of ultraviolet radiation to elicit erythema in human skin depends strongly on wavelength, encompassing a range of four orders of magnitude between 250 nanometers and 400 nanometers. What this means is that looking at power and energy arriving, and therefore radiant exposure and irradiance, do not tell the full story when it comes to health effects. Getting a joule of energy from one frequency of UV will not have the same impact as that at another frequency. The development of this standard dose takes into account the varied responses of tissue to different energies of radiation to make it easier to discuss health impacts and create guidelines for exposure. 
Another measure you can, may come across and probably more commonly come across is the UV index. The UV index was originally developed by Environment and Climate Change Canada in 1992 as a way to communicate risk of solar radiation exposure at a given location and time to the general public. The World Health Organization and the United Nations Environmental Program then used it to develop a global standard now used around the world. A UV index of one corresponds to 0.9 standard erythema dose per hour. Predictions are based on meteorological conditions, the thickness of the ozone layer, and the angle of the sun above the horizon. Forecasts give the maximum amount of UV expected for a given day. In radiation protection, there is a dividing line drawn between radiation that has enough energy to strip electrons from atoms and molecules, called ionizing radiation, and that's that which does not, called non-ionizing radiation. For electromagnetic radiation, the dividing line and energies between ionizing and non-ionizing radiation happens in the UV range. There are several global organizations involved in following the science behind radiation protection and making recommendations for its use in society and within the workplace. Two which make recommendations for doses are the ICRP, which deals with ionizing radiation, and the ICNIRP, which deals with non-ionizing radiation. Although UV can be ionizing and is classified as a type 1 carcinogen by the IARC, the ICNIRP, the one for non-ionizing, is the international body which makes recommendations for UV exposures. This is for historic reasons and based on the definition of ionizing radiation being those at energies greater than 12 electron volts. Amongst other resources, the ICNIRP has on their website an expansive document on protecting workers from ultraviolet radiation, including solar radiation. Another widely used guideline for ultraviolet radiation exposure is published by the American Conference of Governmental Industrial Hygienists, or ACGIH, from the United States. They publish the threshold limit values, or TLVs, and biological exposure indices, or BEIs, to assist in the control of numerous health hazards intended for use in the practice of industrial hygiene. They are not developed for use as legal standards, but are well recognized as useful guidelines for developing a fulsome health and safety program. Now, with this background on units and organizations finished, it's time to meet our guest. So hello, Dr. Peters. Good and morning. Thank you so much Good morning. For being here. Thank you so much for having me, Lynn. It's great to be here. So I am. Um, I first found Carex when doing like I do research and things like that um, to answer questions from the public and to prepare webinars and I just found it a very um, useful site for those people that are concerned about different carcinogens and I do I'm, I'm so glad that your organization agreed to be part of this today because I, I think that people need to be aware of um, it's, it's a Canadian resource um, and it's wonderful to see that research happening. So earlier I outlined the various positions you currently hold and some of your past accomplishments, which are very impressive. Do you mind taking a moment to outline your research and uh, which relates to the topic of solar radiation in workplaces? Sure. Uh, thanks, Lynn. So as you mentioned, I'm trained in occupational and environmental exposures and hygiene. And so I've always had a strong interest in uh, prevention of occupational and environmental diseases. Um, and a, a big portion of my research program is around cancer prevention. Uh, in fact, most of it is around cancer prevention. And um, during my PhD training, I did a project that was uh, examining UV radiation exposure in outdoor workers. Um, I became interested in how we quantify that exposure. And since then, I've really taken that focus through into a number of other research projects. And solar UV radiation is one of our priority exposures at CAREX. So it kind of, it threads through both of my research program as well as into our CAREX research as well. Thank you. So you're currently the principal researcher at CAREX Canada. Could you tell us about the research group for those not familiar with the organization? 
Sure. Yeah. So uh, we've been funded by the Canadian Partnership Against Cancer since 2007 to do this work. So we're very fortunate. And the goals of CAREX are to characterize the prevalence of exposure to um, a wide variety of occupational and environmental carcinogens. And so prevalence just means the number of people exposed. And then we also aim to quantify the levels of exposure to carcinogenic um, hazards. And we also have a main focus on knowledge translation. So we really, you know, we we do our science, we do our exposure estimation, but what we really want to do is get those estimates into the hands of people that can, you know, engage in policy and reduce the risk of cancer to workers and to people in their community environments. And, and thank you. And I, I think that's why you agreed to come today, because it is part of, like, you're very busy, but it's part of getting that information out there. And we Absolutely. appreciate it. So solar UV radiation is a carcinogen, if Carex Canada is concerned with it. And what types of cancer does it cause? Sure. So um, the main cancer that we're probably all aware of is skin cancer. It causes both melanoma and non-melanoma skin cancers. It also causes a form of eye cancer called ocular melanoma. Okay. And are there other known health effects of exposure to solar UV radiation? Yeah, there's several. So some that we're aware of, it maybe isn't a, a necessarily a health effect, but is biological is skin aging and sunspots, things like that, which are not necessarily damaging um, from a biological standpoint, but are a little bit unsightly. It also causes um, actinic keratoses, which are kind of precancerous lesions of the skin. Um, it also can cause um, some immune effects. So um, it can reduce our immune function and leave us susceptible to other diseases. Okay. And in terms of the eyes, um, there's always cataracts as well is a concern. Absolutely. Yes. Yes. Um, so how does solar UV radiation exposure for outdoor workers compare to that for those who work mainly indoors? So I guess the basic answer is it's much, much higher, um, and that causes the risk of skin cancer in outdoor workers to be, some estimates range from two and a half to three and a half times as high for outdoor workers as compared to indoor workers. And that can vary. I mean, workers, some of them are outside all day. Some of them are maybe only outside for a couple of hours. So the risk does kind of differ depending on how much time you spend outside and where you are in the country. Um, but in general, the number one predictor of someone's UV radiation exposure year on year is whether or not they're an outdoor worker. Okay. And so you said about two and a half to three. Um, does the age at which you get that exposure, does that impact? It does. It's a little bit complicated in terms of the difference between occupational exposure and exposures we get in our uh, personal time. So um, by that, I mean the, the risk of melanoma uh, is largely comes from actually sunburns that we get when we're young. So this wouldn't really be considered for outdoor workers. Outdoor workers tend to have this sort of long-term cumulative exposure, which is very strongly linked to non-melanoma skin cancer. Um, so it, it sort of depends, you know, when you're exposed. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it basically it, the, the epidemiology is complicated, but um, it's really just the sort of length of time that you're exposed um, in terms of non-melanoma skin cancer. Yeah, I'm just thinking of young people who might work like as camp counselors or, you know, swim and lesson teach that type of thing or, or theme parks. Um, we don't often think of them as necessarily being, but it's spending four or five years in that type of job when you're in university covering things that... That, that could have an impact later in life. It does, yeah, because uh, typically all cancers, most cancers anyway, take a latency time or like a time between you're exposed and when you get that cancer and skin cancer is no different. So the longer time you have in your life to sort of get that cancer, um, the worse it is for you. So you're right that getting exposures when you're early um, in your life and your working career is uh, can be particularly damaging, especially if those young workers then go on to be construction workers or other workers that spend time outdoors. Yeah, yeah. And and then so like the age at which and then the length of time, you know, repeatedly, if you spend your whole career, that can also increase that increases your exposure over time as well. That's right. So when I think outdoor worker, my mind goes to construction and agriculture workers. I'm originally from PEI, so I, I'm aware that there's a lot of people that spend a lot of time outdoors. Um, but the more I think, the more groups I can come up with, like the example of people that might work in theme parks. So who are the workers most exposed to solar UV radiation? 
Well, your instinct is correct. The workers that are most exposed are in agriculture and construction. Um, but there, as you say, there's a wide variety of workers that spend time outside. Um, that can include people who do, you know, security for buildings, people who work on building services, uh, people, so things like window cleaners, um, people who work in theme parks. So there's lots of people in recreation who are maybe tour guides, um, things like that. Um, even truck drivers, uh, we know that they're at risk of skin cancer, especially on their arm that might hang out of the window as they're driving. So um, even those you might not think of as typically outdoors can have uh, some exposure and can be at an increased risk of skin cancer. Yeah, so it's like somebody may not think it doesn't apply to me because I'm not necessarily in construction or agriculture, but uh, or a workplace may not think of those workers who do spend quite a bit of time. Uh, like in schools, you may not think of the caretakers that are outside taking care of the fields, but, but they are being exposed. So I mentioned that the ICNIRP and the ACGIH both publish recommendations for exposure levels. Um, and like a lot of our participants, they come, they have a background in nuclear x-ray, so they're more used to the ICRP. Um, so in your work, which standards do you consider and or do you use different ones for different purposes? Yeah, it's a good question. And I think we'll maybe we'll get into this in a moment. But um, for there are obviously um, exposure limits that are set by ACGIH and ICNRP for uh, radiation, UV radiation in particular, but a lot of them um, in Canada, at least the way they're applied is that solar UV is exempt. So the sources of UV that are um, artificial, so, you know, welding arcs is the best example that we're most aware of, yeah. um, do have to follow these regulations. But in fact, um, all the provinces and our federal regulations exempt uh, UV radiation. So, you know, we're mindful of it at CAREX and in my research that um, these these limits have um, meaning and they're important. And typically if we are trying to sort of benchmark something, we use the ICNRP. Um, but, uh, but yeah, like I say, they're not enforceable in Canada, so we don't tend to rely on them too heavily. Yeah, but if you were having conversations with um, regulators or trying to get across a comparison of what you're finding in your research versus a standard would tend to be the um, hygienist standard. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, we can oh. sort of, yeah, we can use any yeah. of them, but yes, exactly. Yeah. Okay. So does the wavelength of UV light impact the recommendations by much when you're working in the sunlight with mixed wavelengths? Like these, these standards are behind paywalls often, right? So for somebody that's looking, um, so the Health Physics Society and things like that, they, they give some recommendations or conversations around it. But if you're out working in the sun, are you getting all across the whole spectrum? Like how, how do you compare it. Yeah, so you are getting the full spectrum and we typically the the standards that are set are linked to you you kind of mentioned it the standard erythemal dose they're linked to the sun burning so the the part that gives you a sunburn which is typically UVB it's more energetic radiation source. Um, but there's more and more research coming out that uh, really supports that UVA might play quite a large role in our risk of skin cancer. Um, UVA we've known for a long time is the portion of UV that causes a lot of the aging of our skin and the damage over time. Um, but there's more and more evidence uh, mounting that UVA might also increase the risk of skin cancer. But those standards are very much set for UVB, which, which we know is a, is a driver of skin cancer. Just give it, it's that energetic radiation. Okay. So when you look to the high risk groups within Canada, that we just discussed, how do the levels they are exposed to in Canada compare to a similar worker with a job closer to the equator? Yeah, so definitely latitude matters in terms of, of how much exposure you're getting to UV radiation, and it is the highest in the world at the equator. Um, but there are a lot of different um, factors that predict UV radiation level, including your elevation, including cloud cover, um, even humidity in the air can change your exposure. So it's much higher, and it's higher in a monotonic way as you go closer to the equator, but there is still the potential for very high exposures to be experienced in Canada, especially on very clear days, especially at elevation and even in the winter right that the the snow can reflect the sun back and and cause like snow blindness that type of thing exactly so, exactly yeah. so we have explained in previous webinars that uv is regulated by the provinces and territories except for federally regulated workplaces which fall under the canada labor code and can you make comment on the status of worker protection from solar UV radiation? We kind of already talked about that a little bit, but even like in terms of CAREX Canada's view of it um, and, 
and at its importance? And is there going to be any change in regulation do you expect? So it's very, very important and it's very unregulated in Canada. So I would say that worker protection to, from UV radiation is poor uh, across jurisdictions in Canada. Um, the one exception I'll say is in British Columbia where WorkSafe BC has started to um, take it more seriously. So they haven't sort of codified anything in their regulations. But they are sort of on a small p policy way they are asking employers to have exposure control plans and they're um, compelling workplaces to do more to protect workers from solar radiation, but that's not codified in their, um, in their policies at this point. And to my knowledge, they're the only ones that are doing quite a bit of work in this space. There are, um, there's initiatives by other groups, a lot of times from cancer agencies across the country that are trying to, to put a focus on um, outdoor workers as a key priority group, but, codified into legislation, I would say um, there's no province that's doing a great job of that in Canada. Yeah. And just um, do you know of any around the world that is, or is that common around the world? Yes. Uh, yes. So um, Australia has regulations on the book in terms of exposure. It's, it's a bit challenging, right? Because we know that the risk of skin cancer starts at a very low level of, of exposure to UV. And so in Australia, almost anyone who spends any time out of doors is going to exceed that exposure limit in, a, in less than an hour. So that is sort of why I think that uh, groups have, have shied away from setting those standards because it does kind of open them to liability in that sense. And we know that even in Canada, the majority of outdoor workers would exceed those uh, limits very quickly. Um, and, we, so, and, and would we just as people with non-occupational, would we be exceeding it just by going outdoors? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So that's just try to get your, your brain around where those limits are at. So they're actually quite low. Um, so even outside of work, when we're going outside, we should be very considerate of the fact that this is a carcinogen we're exposing, exposing ourselves to. Absolutely. Yeah. So I think that many of us are aware that being exposed to the sun can lead to skin cancer. And we hear about the UV index, but I think that a lot of people are really good at ignoring that information. Right? That's, that's just my own personal, um, like I said, I grew up in PEI on the beach um, and worked outdoors, that type of thing. And it wasn't until I was older and understood the risk that I started wearing sunscreen. But I know that still a lot of people, they go to tanning booths, they, they do things to get that tan, right? So I, I don't think that we have a good understanding the relative risk that staying out in the sun all day can have compared to other things that cause cancer. So can you give any examples of things that are comparable to spending time out in the sun? Yeah, it's a really good question. I, I tend to not like to do it just because yeah. um, we, you know, Cancer is not one disease and it really differs depending on what type of cancer we're talking about. And most skin cancers are treatable. So it's not the same as sort of comparing it to something that might cause, you know, a lung cancer, which oh. is very, very, very deadly. Um, but it is important to, yeah, the UV index is an important tool, you know, homegrown, made in Canada. Um, so, you know, getting some sun is good. So I, I don't like to sort of be a hard line that you should never go in the sun. It's, it makes people feel good. It gives us some vitamin D. There's really, really good things about the sun, but that's why the UV index is important. So you can get some sun when the UV index is below three, the risk of you getting a sunburn at that level is pretty low. It's once it starts to get above three into that moderate range and six and above when it's a, it's a high risk of getting a sunburn for people with fair skin. So it is still, there's like sort of an individual, um, calculation you have to do because people with darker skin are at lower risk and they can spend more time in the sun without experiencing a sunburn and those damaging effects. So whereas yeah. people, people like me with very fair skin, I've got to be careful about that uh, pretty much all the time, uh, especially yeah. in the summertime. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. So I briefly explained the origin definition of the UV index, but not really how it's used. And it's probably, it's a very useful tool for everyday people, right? So could you go more into more detail about how exactly it works? Yeah, so the UV index is very cool because it takes um, sort of a real science, there's a real metric behind it and it boils it down into a single digit that we can understand. And so you can, I, I just mentioned, you can put it in these categories that, um, 
a UV index of zero to two is a low risk, three to five is moderate, um, six or seven is high, and then anything above that, you're starting to get very high, and a fair skin person would probably start to get a bit red within 10 or 15 minutes at those high, high levels. Um, so it just gives us kind of a, a standard tool. I mean, you'll see it on your app, on your weather app, on your phone, the UV index is there. So you can take a look and sort of know um, you can, you can do your own sort of hazard assessment in terms of, you know, should I, I should probably get some sunscreen on. I should probably get in the shade, especially if it starts to get, you know, six or seven, then we're getting pretty high up there. Um, but again, you can also use it as a tool for when it's a little bit safer to be outside when it's less than three. Okay. That's great. So the SED or it takes into account the different impacts due to the different wavelengths of UV but also, as you had mentioned, different skin types have more or less susceptibility to solar radiation damage, depending on melanin levels and the dispersal of the melanin throughout the skin. How's that accounted for in guidelines and measures like the UV index? So it's not. So that's that sort of personal um, risk assessment that that we have to do. So yeah, there's there's sort of a range of skin types. The, the typical scale uses six different sort of shades. I'd be at the sort of low end of the sh of the melanin scale. Um, this is not to say that um, everybody can't get skin cancer. Certainly, even people with very very dark skin can get skin cancer. And the risk there actually becomes more of missing it because you know skin cancer is sort of an interesting one in that we can see it. Um, we can't usually see cancers as they develop in our bodies, but we can see skin cancer. It gives a very visual cue. But for those with really dark skin, it can be hard to distinguish them, uh, a, a cancer from the sort of background melanin tone that, that people have. So um, it's important in that case to get regularly checked by a dermatologist, monitor your moles, monitor any weird changes in your skin. Um, but we really do, um, it is kind of up to the individual. And many of us know, I think, especially those who have really fair skin, I know that if I go out in the sun for, you know, if the UV index is six or seven, I'm going to be turning red within 10 or 15 minutes. So I'm mindful to make sure I have sunscreen on in those cases. Yes, thanks. Um, what is a photosensitizer and why are they concerned for those people that work outdoors? Um, so photosensitizers, there's a few types. So some of them are medications. So sometimes maybe, maybe you've taken a medication where your doctor said this is going to make you more susceptible to the sun. Um, so maybe try to avoid it or wear sunscreen if you're taking this medication. And some of them are different things that you might work with, different chemicals at work. So an important one for um, farmers might be pesticides. So many pesticides are photosensitizers. So if you're working with some of these um, pesticides, you can be more susceptible to the damaging effects of UV. Um, so it's just helpful to be mindful of what else you might be working with um, if you are an outdoor worker that might actually put you at even more risk um, from UV radiation. Now, do you know if that would be listed on an MSDS sheet if somebody was working around that? It should be. Um, it okay. is one of those things that, that should be listed. Not MSDSs aren't always perfect, oh, but, yeah. um, but yes, it should be on there. Okay, great. Are there any engineering controls that workplaces use to help lower the worker's dose? So like workplace things rather than just the sunscreen for the worker? Yeah, so there's the engineering controls that we think of the most often are shade structures. And so these can be either permanent if you sort of have a job that's always in the same spot or they can be temporary so that you kind of have something that you bring along. Maybe it's an umbrella that you can affix to the machinery that you're working on. Um, there's also uh, the option of using administrative controls. So basically trying to schedule your work time outside of those peak hours, which in Canada depends where you are slightly, but tends to be between the hours of noon and two is the really the strongest time. So if you can schedule your lunch break in a shade, uh, shady area during that time, that can be really helpful. Or if you are a worker that has mixed indoor and outdoor work that you need to do, trying to do your indoor activities between the sort of midday time can really reduce your risk of exposure. And in some, some cases, and at some times of the year, that's when you're getting most of your exposure in Canada is really during that peak, peak time. So, so we can do something about it that's not just sunscreen. Um, you can also wear different types of PPE, um, including wide brim hats, long sleeve pants, uh, long sleeve shirts and pants um, to cover yourself up, especially if you're working in those peak times. Yes. So, and for those, you just mentioned um, a lot of protections for the workers themselves to do. So wearing the, the clothing in terms of the clothing is, is it guaranteed that a clothing would protect you from UV or how, how can you tell, um, in terms of like the things like the weave and stuff matter, or does the material matter? 
Yeah, that's great. So the weave does matter. Um, something with a tighter weave um, and a darker color is going to work better. Of course, that does, that can make you a little bit hotter. So you do have to balance that a little bit with your risk of heat stress. So if you're in a really hot and humid part of Canada, that can be harder. And maybe uh, you'd want to reach for a shade structure before wearing kind of a long sleeve black shirt. Um, but typically those do work better than something that's a lighter color and a lighter weave. Um, there's also um, available um, clothing that has UV protection actually um, kind of baked right into it. So those can be helpful and they are typically are kind of a lightweight fabric, which is nice. So it is, um, it can be useful in areas where you're kind of getting in these high temperatures and you want to avoid getting heat stress at the same time that you're trying to avoid um, that risk of sunburn and skin cancer. Thanks. So in nuclear and x-ray, people often wear dosimeters to track their dose. Is there anything comparable for solar UV radiation? So there is in more of a research um, angle. So at Carex, we have a bunch of dosimeters that we have used in multiple studies to measure UV radiation in outdoor workers. And a lot of that was really just awareness raising because I think a lot of people have assumed that the exposure just isn't high enough in Canada to be worried about it. And with these dosimeters, we've basically demonstrated that it's definitely high enough to be putting people at risk. Um, and it does vary across the country, but in every single study we've done, there are many, many people who are overexposed. So we have those dosimeters, but they're not typically used in the way that these dosimeters that um, x-ray techs or other people who work with known radiation sources work. And there's not sort of a, you know, those happen because there's regulations around that and a, and a process to kind of collect and house that data. So that doesn't yeah. exist for UV, but there are dosimeters that we use for research purposes for UV. Okay, great. Um, where would a worker or employer go to find out more information on this topic? So you can always go to the CAREX Canada website. We have, a, there's a whole special topics page which, ha which has everything about UV radiation uh, for outdoor workers that we've done. And that's, there's a number of different related research projects that I briefly touched on. There's our estimates of occupational exposure showing you the types of industries and occupations that should that are of concern. You can also see information by your province. So the top jobs might actually vary by province um, depending on the, you know, the types of, of labor force that, that exists in each province. Um, and I would also suggest um, looking at the website of your Ministry of Labor um, or Workers' Compensation System depends on which province you're in. And in particular, I will say, I know I mentioned them before, but WorkSafe BC has quite great resources and they do actually share some of our CAREX research, uh, resources on their website as well, um, including some newly developed sun safety messages for outdoor workers that we developed at CAREX that kind of take the standard ones for the general population and make them a little bit more applicable for outdoor workers. And so those are all on the WorkSafe BC website as well as on our CAREX website. So um, if workers or employers are interested, those would probably be the best kind of Canadian sources that they could use. Okay, great. So now we're going to move over to taking some questions from uh, the participants that are here. We thank them for coming today. Um, so we have uh, from Robin that has there been any work done to compare the UV radiation dangers compared to the chemicals that are in sunscreen products? Um, yes. So the, you know, despite or besides the times that we've seen that have been high profile where there have been um, contamination issues with sunscreen, which certainly happens, and then Health Canada and companies do have to issue recalls, which is very unfortunate. Um, sunscreens are safe. Um, so the damage that you'll get from UV radiation is much more of a concern than anything that's in a sunscreen product, unless you're allergic to something in that product. So um, sunscreen safe. Um, keep an eye on Health Canada recall list just in case, because some of the processes can introduce things that are harmful. But by and large, the risk of skin cancer is far higher than anything that you'd, um, you'd be exposed to than in the sunscreen itself. And do you, um, just following off of Robin's question, do you have a recommendation, like sometimes people say over zinc oxide versus other ingredients? Do you personal or in your work, do you have a recommendation on one type over another or are they all relatively the same? Um, I would say that, I mean, I'm not a dermatologist. So I'm, a, I'm a research scientist in this space. And so if you're concerned, I would say rely on a, on a dermatologist. But in general, I think um, 
what we want is something that you're comfortable using, that you can put enough of it on. Um, so some people don't like the feeling of a sunscreen. That's okay. Get a different sunscreen. So for my, from my mind, it's just the best sunscreen is the one that you're going to wear consistently and that has a broad range, a broad spectrum protection of SPF 30 or above. So I don't have any recommend, recommendation beyond that. As long as you're comfortable wearing it, it feels nice to put it on every couple of hours and it has that at least 30 SPF, then I think you're good. <laughs> Okay, that's great. So um, to the participants, if anybody wants to just unmute for a moment and ask a question, or you can type it in the chat room, um, it's a great opportunity to speak to someone that's researching in the field. Otherwise, looking at the time, um, I have a tendency to talk a lot, and people may not want to hop in there, but... But I, I really do appreciate just looking at the time, it is kind of time to wrap up, um, that uh, we do really appreciate uh, not only you being here today, but the work that Carex is doing to help. Oh, um, radiation from lightning. Would that be, does that provide UV or is that within your research? That is a great question. And I'm not totally sure. I don't think so. I think lightning is mostly, um, is mostly visible light oh. energy. Oh, lighting. Sorry. Oh, lighting. I, I read that too. <laughs> I need to, uh, that's bifocals for you. Um, from lighting. So that would be more for indoor workers or people that work outdoors with additional lights. How, how is the work light outside versus the light inside? So the light inside um, doesn't, oh, from grow ops. Okay, that's okay. That's great. Thanks for specifying that, Lauren. Um, so yes, there are, there is some radiation from, you know, things like grow ops and cannabis growing facilities. A lot of that is infrared radiation. And we, we are um, really interested. It's sort of an emerging topic um, for us at Carex. And we've definitely spoken about it with WorkSafe BC before. So those don't, uh, to my knowledge, I don't think they give off a lot of UV. It's mostly visible light, but the the concerning part of the radiation is infrared, which can um, can damage the skin and can you know also create generate too much heat for workers. So that's that's an emerging issue of 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 probably uh, increasing importance as you know as cannabis has become legal and across the country we're starting to have more facilities where people are growing that or the sort of vertical farming um, that happens in greenhouses. So um, I don't know so much about it because I think that uh, the issue is emerging, but we we are aware of it and kind of follow it. So that's a really good question. Thanks for that, Lauren. Yeah. And I, and I think like just from my own research that similar to how you had said that UV can lower some of the immune re or the responses to cancer after the cancer has started, that infrared has that ability as well, that it, it may not be a carcinogen itself, but it can lower the immune response to a cancer that, that is there before we know that it's there. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great point. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? People are coming up with them. Sometimes it takes a minute for the chat to come up as part of it. And I apologize, Lauren, for reading that. I have two screens and I'm looking up through the wrong. Okay. So with that, um, thank you so much um, for coming today, Dr. Peters. And you have a wealth of knowledge. And I just, I, I really do want um, people across Canada to be aware of the Carex project, because I do think um, like we often look to other countries to um, have the research done or find out and then we have to convert it to our units and everything else. So it's wonderful that you guys are doing the work. Um, and before we close the radiation protection portion, portion of the webinar, do you have any parting thoughts on the topic? No, I just really want to thank you for inviting me. It's been great to chat with you, and I'm so glad we have uh, participants online. We also, um, I will just say, it's yes, go and visit our website. We cover a variety of different radiation topics too. It's not just UV from solar. We do have estimates of UV radiation from artificial sources. There's estimates of radon exposure as well as ionizing radiation. So um, I think there might be multiple different exposure estimates that could be of interest to your um, to the participants today. Yes, and, and that is what first drew me to Carex was looking at radon, right? So there's information on radon there, there's information on other occupational exposures. So really, if anyone has a concern for carcinogens in their workplace, I'd really recommend that you check out Carex Canada. And I'll put a link to um, the solar UV when I send out the documentation, but also just poke around the Carex site, it's very useful. 
and um, and it is a great resource for the country. So thank you so much. Thank you, Lynn. And wear your sunscreen, everybody. <laughs> Please do. Please do. <laughs> it, it makes a huge difference. So with that, I'm going to find Mandel. I think she is here somewhere. Um, I have to make her. She is going to be working with, uh, let me see. Mandel, are you here? There you are. I have to make her a co-host. Mandel is here today. Um, for those that this is your first one of our webinars that we always do some radiation protection and then we do a wellness portion. And because we being part of the pandemic and, and working often um, isolated, that it's nice to take some time to take care of our body and our minds. And we thank her for being here today uh, to, to lead us through some yoga practices and mindfulness. So are we ready to go, Mandel? Okay, I'm having a little difficulty hearing you. Oh, sorry. Let, let me see. Maybe, maybe just a little closer, or that might be mine. There we go. Is that better? Yeah, that's better. Thanks. Okay, I'll turn it over to you. Okay. Um, so yeah, we'll just do um, a few different yoga postures, something that we can do seated. So if you have an office job, really great to take with you. Um, and we'll do a little meditation to finish off the practice. So just make sure you have enough space in front of you away from a desk or anything so that you can come up to stand. But really, that's all the space that you need. So we're going to start seated, and I just want you to kind of scoot your seat bones a little bit closer towards the edge of your chair so that you can just kind of press your feet into the floor. Notice the awareness there of your feet. And then we just want you to close your eyes. And all I want you to do is just kind of do a scan of the body from head to toe. So that you can just kind of check in with yourself. Notice just kind of where you're at. Maybe there's tension, maybe there's stress. Maybe you feel relaxed. But I just want you to notice what you notice. Feel what you feel without getting too wrapped up in it. And now I want you to bring more focus and awareness to your breath. Inhale and exhale breath is this powerful way of just calming and nourishing the nervous system. Just by simply being aware. So as you take your next breath in, I want you to feel the breath move in through the nostrils. Move through to the back of the throat. Into the lungs. Into the belly. Maybe see if you can even follow it to those areas that might feel like they're holding on to maybe some tension. Maybe there's a bit of negative emotion being held on. So just allowing the breath to enter into that space. And when you take your next exhale breath, I just kind of want you to visualize that tension or that energy leaving the body on the exhale breath. So the breath moving from that space. Moving from the belly, moving from the lungs, through the back of the throat, and out through the nostrils. And almost imagine this washing quality that the breath has within the body. Washing away any stress, any tension. Now, as you take your next inhale breath, I want you to just start to take your arms and reach them up and overhead. 
You're going to take your palms together and then you're going to flip your palms up towards the sky. Feel yourself just sit a little bit taller here. Try not to hike the shoulders up around the ears and keep the shoulders soft, taking an inhale breath. Now it's just going to be a nice long exhale. As you exhale, you're going to allow the chest to melt over the thighs. We're going to do that again. So breathing in, you're going to take your arms up and overhead. When the hands come towards one another, clasp and then lift the palms up. Exhaling, let the hands just fall heavy towards the mat as you pull. We'll do that one more time. Nice deep inhale breath. And then bowing forward as you exhale. You're going to take your hands to your thighs. As you breathe in, I just want you to take the crown of your head kind of slightly forward there. Feel the seat bones drop into your chair, and now you're going to take your hands and sort of reach them back. Take your palms down towards the floor, and then you'll take your thumbs up so that the palms are opening. Feel the shoulder blades hug back, or feel the shoulders, sorry, open up. Shoulder blades hug towards one another. Take a nice deep inhale breath. Now, as you take your next exhale, you're going to sweep your arms down. Hold here, breathe in. Press into your feet. As you breathe out, you're going to come to stand, taking the arms to the side of the body. Good. Once there, clasp onto the hands. Feel the knuckles pull back. Lift your chest and take your gaze up. A nice deep breath in. As you breathe out, just slowly release the grip you have on your hand and come back to your chair. And once you found your way there, you're going to keep your left arm to the side of your chair. You can kind of put on or you can just let the arm bend. Right arm is going to reach up towards the ceiling. Take a nice deep breath in. As you breathe out, you're going to take your right fingertips towards your left ear. And then you'll just kind of use your hand to guide your right ear towards the right shoulder. Okay, now with that left hand, you can kind of keep it as is, but if you want to just kind of play around with how this feels, you can start to lift the arm up. And then maybe lower it down. You'll kind of notice that little shift around the top of the shoulder, maybe your head lifts and lowers. We're going to take two more breaths here. I just want you to find a place to take that left hand and hold. Take one more breath in. You're going to stay for your breath out. Now with that left arm, you're going to reach it up and over your head. You're going to take your right hand down towards the chair. And then just reach. Feel the left side button open up. Yeah, just bringing awareness to your breath. Breathing in and breathing out. On your next inhale breath, both arms are going to reach up towards the ceiling. As you exhale, you're just going to drop your hands to the sides of the body. We're going to switch into the second side now. So you're going to take that right hand down. You're going to take your left arm up. You're going to wrap your hand towards the right ear. And you'll just kind of gently use that hand to guide your left ear towards your left shoulder. So you'll just feel a little tug or sensation in the top of the right shoulder into the neck area. Now, again, with that right hand, you can keep it still, or you might play around with the left hand. And lower it. Now for the last two breaths here, find a place to rest that right hand, take that right hand, and hold. On your next inhale breath, sweep that right arm up overhead, 
Slowly take your left hand down to the chair. You can grip on, or you can just kind of reach. And then right arm is going to reach off towards the left. So again, just working into the side line. Stay nice and grounded into your seat bones. On your next inhale breath, bring both arms up and overhead. As you exhale, you're going to draw your hands towards your heart center. You're going to take your right elbow to the inside of your right thigh. Once you have that, press the two hands into one another. Take your left elbow, lift it up towards the ceiling. <clears throat> the gentle spinal twist now as you breathe in. I want you to feel your spine just kind of draw forward. As you breathe out, maybe you can work into a bit more rotation. It doesn't have to be big here. So an inhale to lengthen and an exhale to rotate. If all that is feeling good and you want to go a little bit deeper, that right hand can come towards the right foot and left hand can lift up towards the ceiling. Again, spine stays nice and long, so there's lots of expansion. Take one more knee. Now, if the arms are out long, first take them back towards heart center as you exhale. Draw the chest back to center and then lift up. So, long spine. We're going to take that right knee now, gather your knee towards your chest. Whether you're wrapping hands around the knee or you can kind of spy there is your choice, but I'm just going to give a gentle hug of moving towards belly. And then I just want you to point and flex that right foot. To train some of the FLSs, the operations FLSs to do bone testing. And at the time, I was kind of a little against it simply because, like, oh, it's really easy to get down here. Okay, that you want to pull it. As you exhale, you're going to place your right foot on top of your left thigh. As best you can, allow that right knee to open up. Keep a bit of energy in that right foot so you'll keep the knee going protected there. Again, yeah, you'll sit nice and tall. If it feels okay, you might even start to lean forward. Take a nice deep breath in. Deep for your breath out. Come back up on your inhale breath. Gather your right knee back in towards the chest. Okay, now you're just going to slowly kick that right foot out long and then re bend it. We'll do that just two more times. Extend and bend. Last one, extend and bend. Good. Right foot comes back to the mat. Take a nice deep inhale breath. Reach your arms up and overhead. You're going to draw your hands back to heart center. We're going to twist off towards the right now. So left elbow is going to come to the inside of left thigh. Again, working the extension through the spine on the inhale breath and rotation on the exhale breath. Pressing the hands into one another is going to help kind of create that rotation. And if you want to go a little bit deeper into it, you can take your left hand up, right hand up. Keep that left thigh actively pushing into the elbow and arm. Arm pushes back into the thigh. Take the right hand. Draw your hands back to heart center as you breathe out. Bring your chest back to neutral. And then we'll switch sides of the leg. So we'll take that left knee in towards the chest. Again, you can wrap the hands around the knee or you can the thigh. We're just going to point and flex the push, maybe even a circular motion if that feels good. Hugging the thigh in towards the belly. Try to sit nice and tall. Take a deep breath in. You're going to place your left foot now on top of your right thigh as you breathe out. And as best you can, let that left knee open up. It might be a little, it might be a lot, depending on your flexibility there. Keep some energy in that left foot. Sit nice and tall. Breathe in. And then if it feels all right, you'll just begin to fold as you breathe out. <clears throat>
on your next inhale breath, you're going to bring that left knee back in towards the chest. And then you'll just extend and bend. We'll do that two more times. Once the knee comes back in towards the chest, set the foot down. Take a nice deep inhale breath, reach your arms up and overhead. Come into one more movement here. So you're going to take your hands onto your thighs as you exhale. As you take your next breath in, you're going to arch the spine, draw your chest through your shoulders, maybe even take the gaze up. Take a nice deep breath in. Now, as you breathe out, you're going to round the spine, tuck your chin in towards your chest. So, with breath now, inhale, lift, arch, and exhale, round. Do that two more times. Nice deep breath in. Breathe out. Inhale. And exhale. One more time, come back to a neutral spot. Take a nice deep inhale, reach your arms up and overhead. As you exhale, you're going to draw your hands through heart center. And then you'll just come to a comfortable seat now. So go ahead, sit back. Maybe even lean back a little bit. Take your hands into a comfortable position there. And I just want you to close your eyes. Feel your seat bones ground down into your chair. Whole body should feel pretty relaxed. And the breath having this washing effect within the body. Letting go of any stress or any tension. And when we start to let those things go, we then are able to just feel calmer, to feel more relaxed, maybe even feel a bit more present. I'm going to come into just a short meditation here, and it's called a place of content. So just finding this nice space to come into it. Maybe the world around us seems a bit chaotic. So I just want you to imagine a place that feels safe, that feels secure. Maybe it's a space that just kind of feels like home. It might be indoors, it might be outdoors. It might be close to home, it might be far away. But as best you can, I want you to vividly imagine a space. A space of safety. A space where you feel secure. Use your five senses. What do you see? What do you smell? What noises do you hear? Maybe close by, maybe off in the distance. Are you meeting anything? Maybe there's some taste. Maybe it's a taste that's in the air or from the beach. You can almost taste the salt. Maybe it's something that you're physically eating that offers that safety and that piece of contentment. What clothes are you wearing? And how do these clothes feel on the body? Visualize every detail of the space. You 
feel the safety and the security that comes with Imagine yourself in a space relaxed. Um, is there anybody there with you? Present there, you may just soak it all in. Feeling the worries of the day just disappear. Stressors of the week melting. Feeling relaxed, happy, and at peace. Start to draw a bit more awareness now to your breath. The rise and fall of the chest and belly as you breathe in. And as you breathe out, maybe start to wiggle fingers and toes, moving hands and feet. Start to feel yourself back to the physical space you're in there. Knowing that this space is always there for you to come back into a point where we're all just kind of feels a little off kilter. On your next breath in, we're going to take the arms up and overhead. As you breathe out, we're just going to draw our hands to heart center. And at the end of each yoga practice, we finish by saying namaste. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mandel. And thanks to everyone that could stay right to the end. And we know some people had to go back because it's their lunch hour. Um, and um, we will be having more webinars upcoming and we'll send everybody out notifications as they come. Um, so it, it was nice today. We had people right from across Canada because our presenter was in BC and Mandel's out in PEI. So <laughs> we're coast to coast today. So um, thanks, Mendel. We do appreciate your time and uh, your calming energy. So that'll carry us for the afternoon. We'll see you. Take care. See you, everyone.